on this episode of the Oakland Breakdown with Hiker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We recap a painful loss for Oklahoma in Bedlam. We also recap the best games of Week 10 of college football and give you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hostie will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Sunday, November 5th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of November, all you have to do is visit Riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now recording this early Sunday afternoon, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. And Ted Lehman, I am sad. I'm yeah. A, I'm a sad, sad man. I know it. You are not the only one. It's frustrating. It's not fun. Not I'd rather be talking about fun. good stuff. I I hear you. Oklahoma loses the uh, people are calling it the final bedlam. We'll see the next time these two teams step on a football field together. But Oklahoma State fans have bragging rights for a long, long time. It appears because the Cowboys win twenty-seven to twenty-four. And Ted, let's just jump right into it. There is. There's a lot to break down from this football game. Let's start on the defensive side of the ball. What did you see from OU's defense in this one? Uh, it, I mean, it's a weird game. I Because there's there's always stuff that you, you've got to improve and the details are always going to matter. And, you know, the the more difficult the games and the tighter they are, the margin for error gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, I think that overall, they played pretty well. Considering having their best defensive player out, having Reggie Pearson out, being banged up at, at corner some throughout the football game and having to rely on some young guys out there. I mean, all things considered, I, I thought they, they did some good things. Now, we gave up some chunk plays, um, you know, right out of the gate on the first drive. We've got a missed tackle on a little bubble that, that cost us 26 yards. They end up going down and scoring on that uh, that opening drive. Um, you know, there's – gave up 20 yards on the on the easy little split zone to Ollie Gordon. Like, whenever you play a guy like Ollie Gordon – and you know he's on a run like he is. I, the last thing you want to do is just hand him stuff. And we handed him a 20-yard touchdown. He didn't. I, any running back in college football can score on that touchdown. That's you. You have to force them to earn it, and we didn't. And I think it's a mess up. We're in bear, and I think our nose guard. Uh, I think we've got a slant going, and he goes the wrong way. And there's this massive gaping hole there and just easy touchdown. Um, that was frustrating. You know, we gave up a I, – I listed this as a chunk play. It was a 13-yard quarterback draw. It was their second touchdown of the game down in the red zone. Um, it's a quarterback draw. It's a tough play. We slip. We don't rally to the ball. And then – at the point, at the goal line, Robert Spears Jennings comes in and turns it down. Now, I've watched Robert Spears Jennings play football. He doesn't turn anything down. Nothing. If, if anything, a criticism of him is maybe that he's 
maybe too over his skis and aggressive whenever he's coming downhill. But it was right at the goal line. And this is, to me, why the call on Reggie Pearson is horseshit. Last week at Kansas. Because we've got a safety coming up. Wants to defend the goal line. He's one of the hardest hitters on the team. Quarterback's running the football. He pulls up. He doesn't know. Is he going to slide on me last second? Is he going to lunge for the end zone? He doesn't know. In my opinion, that's why he held up there. Which, you know, again, frustrates the hell out of me. The inconsistency with with the way football is officiated. Um, you know, missed tackles. I mentioned the one early. We gave up a, a bubble, had a missed tackle, turned into a chunk play. Um, that was on play six of the game. We didn't have another missed tackle, like what I would characterize as kind of an open field one-on-one missed tackle until play 52. All right. And then we had one on play 64 and then 72 and then play 73 and then play 74. I think the defense got tired. I think they got worn down. Whenever you think about how the fourth quarter went, you know, they had the the 97-yard touchdown drive by Oklahoma State. You know, penalties and stuff helped them out a ton. But 97-yard drive. First play, we fumble the snap offensively. So we have to go back out there. We force a field goal. Good job. But then the offense runs, I think, five plays and then kicks a field goal. And the defense is right back out there. It was They were on the field a bunch in the second half. Uh, the time of possession overall in the football game was like something like 37 minutes to 22. I think so I'm kind of I don't know what to say about it guys that I thought played well there was a handful of them I thought Billy Bowman played really well uh, as always makes a great play on that interception Um, has a unbelievable open field tackle on third and two which forces that fourth and one uh, that we end up stopping them on Um. I, Trace Ford had had the juice. You know, you could tell this game was extra for him. He was flying all over the place, made a couple of really nice plays. A couple of things that don't show up in the in the stat sheet, like recognizing he recognized the throwback screen on one, and you know it was incomplete. But it, if he wasn't there, it would have been a huge play, and he sniffed it out. Um, he played well, and then I thought. Kip Lewis, considering the youth and how much he's played and the shoes he was stepping into, my hat's off. I think he ended with with 15 tackles. I don't know if that's official or not. You know, he had some he had some flyby missed tackles. You know, he had some some fits that were not good. But, you know, some of that, unfortunately for him, he's having to gain most of that experience on the road in a rivalry game with perhaps a big 12 championship on the line. So um, all of those things considered, I thought he, he played really well, but you know, there's some frustrating things in there. I thought it was too much of a, of a stalemate on the line of scrimmage. We, we are more talented than their offensive line. And yeah, it, Hats off to Oklahoma State. They do a good job with their scheme, you know, knowing that they aren't great on the offensive line, and they they find a way around it. And I thought they called a really good game. And watching the defensive film alone, Alan Bowman was the best player on the field. He made some incredible throws. He was lights out in the RPO game, pulling it and fitting it into tight windows, threw some great deep balls, made really smart decisions. I mean, we had the one turnover was off Ollie Gordon just going rogue on a on a throwback play. He's like, oh, they covered a quarterback on the throwback. Why don't I just heave it like a grenade <laughs> downfield? 
um, I thought Alabama Bowman was excellent. And, you know, their receivers made some incredible competitive catches. Hats off to them. They played really well, but defensively, it's – there's not a lot to get pissed off about. You know, I – yeah, I, you want me to get on here and nitpick every single missed fit and missed tackle, and I thought we played with good effort. I thought we sniffed out their their gadget plays really good for the for the most part. They did hit us on a – like the the tunnel screen and go where you go out there and you fake the block and then you rip it up the sideline. They hit us on that one. It's just a good call, and it was executed really well. That was a 20-yard play. Um, they hit us on the the screen to Ollie Gordon. You know, we just – we got no awareness on the defensive line and no vision and recognition at the backer spot. That, that hit us for an 18-yard gain. Um, you know, one of the big plays to, to Ollie Gordon, I think I sent you the clip, is, you know, it's – it's 35 yard gain and it's just the the same counter that we've seen and kip lewis is he's he hits right down the middle of a guy and he strikes this dude really well but he's got to just keep his outside arm free he's got to get on the side get in the gap and that's probably a no gain so there was some stuff like that you know um just a weird game i guess gabe to break down defensively i thought especially with some of the injury issues. I thought the defense played pretty well. Was it perfect? No. Was it as good as it needed to be along the defensive line? No, it wasn't. They they did not play with enough knockback. They did not produce enough negative plays for Oklahoma State. But if you would have told me before the game, OU's defense – is going to hold Ollie Gordon to 137 yards rushing and Alan Bowman's going to have to throw it 42 times. I would have said, does OU win by two or three touchdowns? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel very similarly to how I felt after Kansas. I thought the defense played well enough to win the football game. They gave up 27. Yep. 27. That's that's good enough, especially with some of the the injuries. Do I wish they wouldn't have given up so many stop routes, hitches on the outside in the RPO game, whatever you want to call them? Yeah, do I wish the coverage was tighter? Sure. That's a really tough ask at corner, especially those young guys that were out there on the field. I, all island by themselves. This it's, And a lot of those throws are just in the perfect spot. Yeah. But ultimately, I thought the offense let the football team down. I thought the defense played well enough to win. I I think that's why you feel so weird about it, Ted, because in that type of environment, especially with some of the situations they got put in, for them to hold them to 27 – there, you really can't be that mad about how the defense played. Was it perfect? No, it never is. Did they give up some chunks? Sure. 27 points in a supercharged atmosphere like that one. It's good enough to win the football game. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. And, you know, the the frustrating thing is – you know, we, we forced the turnover. Uh, Bowman intercepts it, returns it out to the 45, I think. And we we don't do much on offense. I think we hit him for a, a nice run on first down. And then I think we go three and out after that. Um, and that's the one where Dylan Gabriel punts it down to the three-yard line, which was a great play, right? If you're not going to get points out of that, what you want to do is at least flip the field position. And we did that, uh, put them down on the three yard line. They had a five yard run on first down and then a no gain. And then they throw the deep ball down the sideline 
and it's clearly offensive pass interference. There's not, there is nothing at all on that play that would ever lead anyone to believe it's defensive pass interference. It's either offensive pass interference or no call. That's it. It, it is inexcusable. And it bails them out on third down, automatic first. I don't know what was said on the sideline. VV said in the post game, all he did was ask a question. 15 yards added onto it. And they're off and rolling on a on a 97 yard drive. So like that's frustrating too. Because whenever you play what you think is is good enough to win and you get you get screwed on a couple of plays like that, it's just it's incredibly frustrating. You got anything else? I don't think so. Again, you know, I we sound so sad. I know. There's gonna I, be some Oklahoma State fans that listen to this and they're gonna feel so much joy with how sad we are. And that's fair. That's how it that's how it goes. You win the game, you get to celebrate. But yeah, defensively, Ted, I I think that group as a whole, with how many young guys they had to play in some key situations, right when the game was on the line. I I think they should have their heads held high, man. I was I, I was impressed with some of the stuff the defense did. Yeah, and you know, three turnovers. And how many times on downs did we was it just once that we turned it over on downs? I think that's yes, right. but it was it it was at a critical time, and I'll talk about it when we talk about the offense. But yeah. you know, well, we turned it over on downs twice, technically the last drive. Yeah, the last drive. Yeah, but, but you know, ten points off of off of turnovers um, that hurts your defense, and one of them was on the twenty yard line on the first right after you got off the field on a ninety seven yard drive, and you forced a field goal out of that. You know, that's whenever the score was twenty four twenty one. And, you know, that was, that was big. Thought they played well enough to win. You got anything else? I don't think so. All right, let's talk about what we saw from OU's offense in the Bedlam loss. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Love's Connect app unlocks exclusive deals can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Love's Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Love's Travel Stops. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamori. It's honey time in Oklahoma. And if you're looking to buy some honey property, the land doctors can help you find the ideal ranch. They build custom hunting lodges and lakes and can turn Oklahoma's raw land into your personal playground. If you'd like to sell some land or you simply want to add to your portfolio, then call Colton Cole at 405. 405- 615-7645 or visit LandDoctors.com. And celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Aleworks. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice-cold beer from Coop Aleworks. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletics events, at the bar at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit SchoonerAle.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. So I, I was thinking about the best way to recap OU's offensive performance in this game. And Ted, I think it's the I think it's for the best just to get the complaining out of the way. Yeah. Did Oklahoma State fake injuries constantly to try and kill OU's rhythm offensively? 
Yes. Is that chicken shit football? Yes. Does the NCAA need to be able to do something about it? Yes. But it is what it is. Was it absolutely insane that the refs didn't call a pass interference when Drake Stoops was tackled in the end zone trying to catch the ball? Should it have been first and goal at the two-yard line? Yes. Is that inexcusable and seem very suspect? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the game, you cannot, when you are on the road, you're in a hostile environment, the, the circumstances are what they are, you cannot leave it up to the refs. You have to play well enough to overcome that. And this offense just didn't. And once again, I thought the defense played well enough to win the football game. And I thought the biggest missed opportunity for Oklahoma's offense came in the third quarter. They had a chance to create separation and to take that crowd out of the game. And they didn't do it. What well, defense gets two turnovers on downs in a row. Then Ollie Gordon throws an INT on <laughs> just a hilarious play. But the defense is getting stops. And out of that entire sequence, OU's offense gets seven points. And that was the Tawi Walker touchdown. Uh, you, you call fourth and five play and the ball goes to Brendan Thompson. Okay. Now you're running mesh. He's got to sit down in that zone faster. I thought Dylan Gabriel put the ball where it needed to be put. Nick Anderson. I did not really think that was OPI. He's running a route and the guy drills him straight in the chest. I I don't know. But Brendan Thompson, you got to make that catch. But it's fourth down, huge critical moment in the game. And you go to Brendan Thompson. I, I find that interesting. You've got, so that results in a turnover on downs. On the next drive, you're third and five. You run it trying to set up going, it, going for it on fourth down, in my opinion. Get stuffed. Then you have to have your quarterback punt the ball. It's well executed, but the defense strings together stops in that period of the game, Ted. You have to separate. You have to recognize that in that moment in the game, in that sequence in the game, you have a chance to bury them. You have a chance to step on their throat. You have a chance to take complete control of the football game. And the offense didn't do it. Well, and I thought that was that was the biggest missed opportunity of the game. It was right there. The defense was playing well, getting stops, and they just they couldn't take advantage of it, man. Well, you know, the the middle eight is is something we've been talking about, and you go back to the last possession um we force a three and out after Zach Schmidt missed the field goal right um which I thought was the correct decision and he he put a nice attempt on it you force a three and out you got what you want right you got a chance to go down and score right before halftime and we get nothing out of it we we three and out ourselves and have to punt it and the defense is out there, but you still have a chance because you got the ball coming out of halftime, right? That's the whole, that's the whole reason of the, the middle eight, right? You're trying to double up there. Second play out of halftime. We throw the interception, which, you know, I, he gets hit as he throws. I, you know, I don't know what happened with the, with the protection. I don't think it was pass interference down the field. But, you know, it's still, 
it's still a turnover on the second play. So you've you've totally squashed your middle eight, but the defense answers by, like you said, turnover on downs, score t- we score a touchdown. Turnover d- on downs, we turn it over on downs. Interception by Billy Bowman, we have to punt. I mean, that's you're right. It's like the the third quarter we had all the opportunity in the world to to grab a hold of the lead and run with it, but we just could not get out of our own way. We couldn't execute. No, and one one of my biggest complaints about all the RPO stuff, and I thought that it was a good it was a good comparison because Oklahoma State was doing a ton of RPO stuff as well. But where are their RPO throws, Ted? Uh, like it's singled out with one one wide out, and it's off of that hard play action is what most of it was on on hard slants. It's or, slants, it's stop routes, some go balls. And then you look at Oklahoma's stuff. Where are all the RPO throws? In the middle of the field. And out wide at or behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah. I think the perfect, you know, the perfect example, what it's third and eight at the plus 27. This is right before Zach Schmidt misses the field goal. And you throw a th- a swing screen to Jake Drake Stoops on third and eight, and you lose six yards. And Schmidt misses from 51. So I just, there's so much at or behind the line of scrimmage, man. And especially in a game like that, where, I mean, it was pretty clear that no one could cover Drake Stoops. He was turning those guys inside out all day long. Uh, Nick Anderson did a nice job for the most part, running away from guys on the deep over routes on this, on, on the horizontal stuff. I still don't think they were aggressive enough pushing it down the field or having more throws in the intermediate, like in that eight to 10 to 12 yard range. It's just too much at or behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Especially when the matchup's the way it was in that game. Yeah. I also think that, and this this may not be just an Oklahoma thing. It may be a college football in general over the last handful of years. I think we spend way too much time trying to set ourselves up to go for it on fourth down. And that's why you get so many things on third, on third and eight, third and and seven, third and six, that are either trying to be gotcha runs or at or behind the line of scrimmage plays. Because we're not trying to get the first down. We're trying to set ourselves up to get it on fourth down. And you, you, I I think you're just, you're asking for trouble to continue to do that. Like it's one thing on on third and seven to run a route downfield. It's not there, check it down and take the short one and then see if you got an opportunity on fourth. That's one thing. It's different to throw a a designed swing where it's coming out of the quarterback's hand right away and someone's getting the ball at or behind the line of scrimmage. Those are two to, to, two totally separate things. And and again, I think it's we're enamored with setting ourselves up to go for it on fourth down in that that middle of the field area, kind of no man's land. Just get aggressive and go get the first down. We'll deal with the other stuff afterwards. Our defense is playing great. It ain't, it's it's okay to punt the football. Try and get the first down. I hear you. And they were actually pretty good on third down. With five of twelve. Not perfect. We're in Oklahoma but... State, I, I think we beat Oklahoma State in pretty much every category except for time of possession and turnovers. Turnovers are it's usually a pretty important one. That's, I mean, that's the story of the game, in my opinion. Well, now we're going to go through the positions individually, just like we do offensively. Uh, but 
and I'm trying not to be too critical because I don't I don't want to take away anything from Oklahoma State, but this is just how I feel as I evaluated them going into that game. And as I went back and watched this tape, scoring 24 points against that defense is just, it's not good enough. It's not a good defense. It's not. Where are the impact players? Nicholas Martin, yeah, good player. Colin Oliver, good player. Other than those two guys, scoring 24 points against that defense is just, it's not good enough, man. It's not. Yeah. Dylan Gabriel, 26 37 for 344, a touchdown and an interception. Thought he did some good things in the intermediate passing game. Uh, some good timing throws, pretty accurate. He's he's got to change whatever his thought process is on deep balls. He's, it's got to change. What do you underthrow? Five of them. Most of them have been underthrown this year, even the completed and, ones. And he had three or four to Farouk. Farouk is not a burner. And Farouk is waiting and waiting and waiting on the football. He's either got to get a stronger arm or he's got to throw it sooner. I Something's got to change. Flatten it out, something. Points are being left on the field because he cannot push it down the field the way he needs to. Uh, the interception was just a bad decision. He sees the safety back there. And he's under pressure, but he he had Sawchuck on the check down. He had Stoops on an out route. Both guys are open, but he feels the pressure. He lets it fly. It shouldn't happen. Oklahoma State's rushing three. It's a six-man protection. They're rushing three. Nicholas Martin, he triggers late. He adds late. Destroys him. Interception just should be a clean pocket. It's frustrating. I thought Dylan Gabriel, I thought he took some of the RPO game when he should have just handed the damn ball off. And I thought there were several of those. And it's unfortunate because you can see the run develop perfectly Mm -hmm. on a couple of them. I cannot believe there were not any called QB runs in this game. That blows my mind. With how aggressive they were, fitting the run with the safety, I, I take uh, help me understand, Ted. I don't Was know. Was there a single called QB run in this game? Like QB power, QB sweep. There was the QB sweep where they threw the RPO to the outside on it. Yeah, but other than that. How is there no QB run game at all? I don't know. That's something that they've had a, quite a bit of success with recently. You know? um, I don't know. Maybe they had, I, I'm, I'm sure they had them all up and ready for in the game, but didn't just didn't get to any of them. I have, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't Which, know how that know, happens. I, I think that, that always helps our running game out. It felt like we ran it good enough. Um, I I don't know that you necessarily had to have it, but it's been it's been a nice addition to our offense whenever it's been in there. Alan Bowman had more rushing yards than Dylan Gabriel in this game. And I think he only had one run. That touchdown run it was the only time he took off that I can remember. That's- all- that's sort of saying if you take the sack yardage out which by the way you don't have to do for bowman he didn't get sacked one time dylan gabriel he he did not run the ball it's crazy man last thing on dylan gabriel great punt right footed how about that it was it was good it was good uh running backs start with gavin sawchuck a bright spot in this football game 
Uh, 13 for 111, had the long 64-yard touchdown. His timing with the run schemes was much better. The patience was there. It looked from a from a back's path and timing and the way that things were developing along the offensive line. It just looked much better. It looked in sync. Now, he's still he's got to make more guys miss. He is still getting tackled by the free hitter. You have to make those guys miss, man. But I thought he looked explosive. It's as good as he's looked. It's as healthy as he's looked all season long, and it's not even close. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for positive takeaways from this game, I thought 27 looked as good as he's looked all season long, and that is something to be excited about the rest of the way. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and, it, you know, not only did I think Sawchuck looked better and his timing looked better, I feel like the gap, gap scheme stuff that we're running, the offensive line is starting to get in a better rhythm on some of that stuff too. Just kind of taking it all in, it feels like, and, and perhaps it's the scheme and how Oklahoma State was blocking it, but felt like some of those guys did a really good job getting around, turning their head back around, getting blocks on guys from the inside out, good physical kickout stuff. Seemed overall that, that that's maybe they they tend to block that stuff a little bit better than some of the zone stuff. I completely agree. Uh, I think Tawi Walker's touchdown run is the perfect example. How about that guy? coming in on one leg in the second half gave him everything he had. I mean, all you have to do is go watch the touchdown run. That dude was 50%, Perfect. Yeah. 60%. I, I, but the GT counter that he scores on was blocked so well that it didn't really even matter. And watching Tawi on the tape, the dude was playing in slow motion and was still very effective. It's hard to explain. It's almost more effective. Like people were like running past him and he was just cutting back on him. <laughs> on it him. was, it was strange to watch, but I, I, I thought he displayed some serious toughness because clearly that ankle is, is not right. Javante Barnes. The argument there, there's definitely an argument. Was that the right time for a trick play? I don't know. I didn't like it. I didn't like it, but the ball hits him right in the chest. Catch the ball. Now, I believe he's supposed to catch it, hand it to Dylan, and then Dylan going to his left is supposed to carry out just a levels sprint pass concept. I think he's going to flip it to Drake on the reverse. I think it was going to be a fake reverse. A fake one, because that's what they did against Kansas, right? So they Correct. were going to fake that and then have some, some over routes coming. The, the sprint pass was not open. So if he hands it to Dylan, I think he throws it away. I think you go to second down. But Javante Barnes, he bobbles it. You just take the loss, man. Once the bobble, it's dead. You just, you just, you just take the loss. But. Javante Barnes was your, it was clear. He was 1B coming into the game, right? It was Sawchuck and Barnes. I just, it seems reactionary. He made a horrible mistake. Yes. It's a terrible turnover. There's no doubt. But we didn't see him in the rest of the game. You got Smothers out there who you and I are both excited about. But you got him out there in critical situations, and Javante Barnes, he never saw the field again. You got Tommy Walker out there on one leg. I just, it seems, it seems awfully punitive, man. Right? Like, if you make one mistake, and it's a horrible mistake, but you don't get to play the rest of the football game, and you're a big part of the game plan? I don't I know, man. That just... Well, 
I think that comes from I think that comes from the frustration of the offense not playing well. You know, I, I think that's – if you're playing well, you're scoring a bunch of points, then I think you're you're more likely to look past something like that. But when you're not and everyone's on edge and the pressure cooker is building, the mistakes and the response to the mistakes just get – you know what I'm saying? It's uh, it's not a good place to be in, as a as as a coaching staff, as a as players. It's just, it's not fun. It was the second drive of the game, and he never saw the field again. That's harsh. I mean, that's I listen. I, you have to execute. You can't make mistakes. I get that, but going with Smothers instead of Barnes. I don't know. I don't know. Wide receivers. If Dylan Gabriel is going to keep underthrowing them on deep balls, they got to learn to jump into defenders and draw PIs. It's not fun to talk about, but you have to take advantage of the rules in that situation. They had several of them where if they just jump back into the defender, you're going to get the flag. Also, the wide receiver group having three false starts is insane. What's going on with that? Like, that's I've, a, I've never seen that in my entire life. Happened last week on the most one of you could argue one of the the most critical play of the game. You know, we didn't and it's veteran up. guys, Farouk and Stoops. Yeah. Now Farouk's second false start, I didn't see it. Like I I watched it ten times on tape, and my note is false start number three. Don't see what the refs seeing. So did, I, he, did he argue it? It didn't look like it, so something happened. I, I, yeah. Maybe it looked like he sneezed. I, I, I don't know. But, yeah, you just can't have that. That's unacceptable. Uh, Drake Stoops, game of his life. I mean, how good was he? And I, I feel for the guy because he doesn't really even get to enjoy it. He was fantastic. Route running, he played He played as fast as I've ever seen him play. Was elusive with the ball in his hands, finishing with physicality. He was absolutely fantastic. He was the best player on the field for Oklahoma. Yep. And maybe his demeanor, maybe his comment, like, you you got to argue the P.I. more. Right. But I I have to assume – he thought they would throw a flag for him being tackled before the ball arrived. It's just incredibly bad officiating. It's inexcusable. I, it's ridiculous. But I did not understand the last play of the game for OU's offense. Now, we could talk about the spot. It's a bad spot. They don't reward Farouk. For the extra effort, rain comes and shoves them all, shoves the pile. They get a couple extra yards. I don't know if Levy called that play thinking it was fourth and three. But fourth and five, and you run a three-yard route, that's just, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, And I hate the call anyways. There is an epidemic of teams calling sprint pass in key situations. Why take away... Half of the field. I don't understand. Yeah. I just don't understand. And it's happened in a lot of places. I don't get it. And it's not, it's not our, like, we, we just, we don't do that. That's not our, it's not our offense. It's a one-off play. You know, you don't ever see that anywhere else. And I, it's tough. Like you you sell out on pretty much one option. Not a whole lot, no, not a whole lot else there. It's one option. That's what that play has, right? If the if the guy that is man on stoops does not get picked, he's covered and he gets tackled for a three yard gain, and that's exactly what happened. Guys are sitting on the sticks. I don't, I, I don't understand that play call at all. Now they did do some really cool stuff with Drake Stoops, right? Lined him up at running back. Um, that, and that was great design by Levy. Ryan, line stoops up at running back. Oklahoma State cuts him completely loose. You fake power pass. 
to distract the linebacker's eyes. There's miscommunication. He's wide open. Great play design. Great execution. Other wide receivers, Farouk, 7 for 98. Thought he played really fast. Watching him on tape. Looked good. But DG just could not get it to him on those deep balls. Uh, he did not get rewarded for fighting hard on that extra for extra yards on that last possession. I I did not see any ref blowing a whistle, waving his arms, so I did, I don't know. But thought he was he was good with the ball in his hands after the catch in a couple situations and did some nice stuff. Nick Anderson up and down. Had a couple really nice plays. The 49-yarder in the first quarter. I sent you the clip. I've never seen defensive backs run into each other that hard. That was hilarious. Uh, hilarious and borderline scary. <laughs> they, I mean, just right in the middle of the field. It was somewhere in heaven, Mike Leach is smiling. <laughs> just a little deep mesh concept. And both defensive backs just collide at full speed. And Which, What's awesome about that is the way Drake Stoop sets it up. Like he pushes it high and then at the last second cuts under. Nick Anderson is as impactful he was on some plays. He dropped a 40 yard gain. You're on the road. You're playing a good football team. You got to make those plays. You, you got to make those plays. Uh, Brennan Thompson had a few opportunities. Uh, if, if you want to say he could have done a better job fighting for the ball on that, on the interception, then okay. But that that's just a tough situation. He's got to catch that ball on the fourth and five that resulted in the turnover on downs. Even if they call OPI on that, which they did on Nick Anderson, you, you, you have to catch that ball to get another play. Mm-hmm. And even you, you, you punt and pin them deep there. Like those, that stuff matters. Got to catch the ball. Uh, tight end wise, uh, Austin Stogner had some rough moments on the perimeter. He absolutely did as a blocker. He he did. He got run through a couple times, and that resulted in some negative plays. But I thought he battled in the box. And, and he is, he's not an elite blocker, but he's the best they've got. And... Farouk catches, you remember Farouk catches the big one down the sideline. Looks like it's going to be P.I. Turns out he ca- catches it. Right. And that ended up being the drive where Schmidt makes the field goal to cut it to 27-24. Stogner, right, it, it is the play directly after Farouk's catch. They run the oh shit screen. And Stogner's a little late getting out. He's a little late. He's got to probably have a little more urgency in that moment. He is wide open for a touchdown to take the lead. Wide open, uncovered, no one around. And Walter Rouse gets beat by Colin Oliver. And you could make the argument that Dylan Gabriel ends up a little too deep with the, with the play fake that he's carrying out, but it's a beautifully designed play. It's a perfect call by Levy. He's wide open. He's wide open to go score a touchdown to take the lead in the football game. And Rouse just gets run around. They're doing a little power pass, play action fake. And DG gets sacked instead of hitting a wide open Stogner. It's it's like, that's the, that's a great encapsulation of what happened with the offense in this game. Like just the opportunities are there and the intention to detail is not. Should be a touchdown to take the yeah. lead. I, Execution. Yeah. It's one it's one like little thing here and there on just a handful of plays throughout the game and it's offense and defense where just that little bit costs you. You go back like we're not we're not good enough right now that we can afford a bunch of mistakes. We can't. 
I mean, it's just, it's just the nature of the beast. That's where we're at. You've got to execute on all of these opportunities. And whenever you have an opportunity to hit a home run or to make a big play, you just absolutely have to have it. We, we, we cannot overcome turnovers. We cannot overcome missed opportunities to put points on the board. Offensive line, Walter Rouse. Now, I know that I just pointed out his worst play of the football game, but played with good strength in the run game. I got pulled a little bit, but overall he was solid. He played the way that he's been playing. Uh, so I, I have minimal complaints. Caden Green, he's going to be really good, man. If he can approve his agility, like his lateral quickness, the sky is the limit for him at offensive guard. He did some really nice things in the gap scheme stuff, coming around as a puller. And he plays with the nastiest attitude of any guy on that offensive line. Finishes blocks better than anyone else on that offensive line. Putting guys into the turf. He buries more guys than anyone else. He's a true freshman. I don't know. I, I love that for him, but the fact that I'm saying that about a true freshman and not about a fourth or fifth year senior bothers me. But it is what it is. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give Caden Green the credit he deserves. He absolutely deserves credit. Where do you think his future is? Is it going to be a guard? It's guard. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I think he can be, if he can improve his suddenness, right? His twitch, because everything fat, everything happens faster in the inside, right? There's less space. If he can in, anticipate some things more, like Nick Martin, a couple times is just pouring it downhill. And the and that's and there's a couple times early where Caden Green is late, but this was something that was really cool to see. Later in the game, he realizes, hey, I my double team is going to four. I have to be faster. And he adjusted. He comes off the double quicker. He gets a piece of Martin. He gets his job done. That's really encouraging stuff from him. But, yeah, I continue to be impressed for him, for a true freshman, to go into that type of atmosphere, play the way that he did. It's a hell of a job. Yeah. Andrew Rame. Um I I feel for him. It's a lonely feeling as a center. I've been there. And it it's brutal that All people are going to remember is the snap. And he snapped it a little early. DG's like mid clap. The ball's coming. It hits him right in the knee. It's low and hot. It's a bad snap. It is. It's also a little unlucky where it hits DG and just goes shooting back forward. It's a bad snap, but also a little bad luck. And it's a massive play in the football game, obviously. And I can assure you, no one feels worse than Andrew Rank. So I, I feel no need to pile on. And he and he was a wreck after the game, and all I could do is give him a hug. But other than that, he played well. He played one of his best games. He he lost a couple battles. He got pulled a couple times in some of the zone stuff. He got pulled early. He got pulled on the second play of the game. I gave up a pressure but adjusted well, and <laughs> he played well. But all and sometimes this is how it works in football, especially when you're touching the ball every play like you do at center. All, all anyone is going to remember is that snap. And, and that sucks. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things you don't even think about that is is not an easy thing to do to snap the football which by the way you know we're in shotgun 
every single snap. So it's you're talking about, you know, give or take 75 times a game. It's got to be perfect. And you got to do it with someone over the top of you. And like, that's just, that's just like a check mark that nobody thinks about is that that's got to be perfect 75 times a game. It's, it's the nature of the beast. And I hate that for him. I, you know, that's why I wish we were, that's why I wish we executed as a football team so much more to where we can absorb some stuff like that. But right now, like we don't execute good enough across the board to where if something happens like that, it be, it becomes catastrophic. I wish we would play ourselves into a position where we had a little bit more margin for error. I hear you. Don't. Like right now, it feels like every call, every missed assignment, everything is like a potential game loser, which I mean, that's that's how it is in big time football. But, you know, we we have plenty of room to put ourselves in better positions to where we can absorb some stuff. I hear you. Uh, McCabe Matoyer just finishing out the O-line. And I like, hey, it was the same five guys the entire football game. I, I like that. Uh, went with went with a lot of guys that played a lot of football, and then you know Caden Green at left guard. I I thought McKay Matoy he's he, he's still hurt, right? still playing through that ankle. He did not get a ton of movement at the point of attack in, in the gap scheme stuff and the zone stuff, but he did he did a really nice job on, on some of the counter schemes where he's the kick out puller, arriving with physicality. He did. I mean, McCade played the way that I expect him to play, right? Lost some battles, got pulled, and, you know, gave up some pressures. But overall, pretty solid job. Uh, Tyler Guyton is where – I don't know what happened. Something happened to him in the second half. I'm not sure if he had a migraine or, like, some, something was going on. Like, he kept playing with his eye. I don't know what it was. But something was absolutely going on with him in the second half. And it did, It just did not – it did not look like he was feeling very well physically. So that's certainly something to keep an eye on. But he he did not play as physical as he needed to in the run game. It's just a little too passive. Not enough violence, not enough striking of the double teams, not enough movement. Uh, played a little high at times. Uh, pass protection, he continues to be. He's probably one of the best pass protecting tackles in all of college football. But the run game is where uh, where it, it, it's got to be better. Just has to be better. And I know he's capable of more. Uh, he looked on some of the he did a nice job when he was the he was the second puller on a couple of those those counter concepts, but also in a couple of them he just pulled around and did not look like he knew where he was supposed to go. And and several times unblocked guys that I think he was uh, supposed to account for made the play in those situations. So that was I don't know that was strange. It was just too up and down for how talented he is. Too up and down. Yeah. It was, it should have been better. That's, that's kind of where I'm at with it. it. It needed to be better. And unfortunately it was not. And credit to Oklahoma State's defense. Those defensive tackles fought like hell. They were violent. You know, they didn't make a ton of plays, but they were violent. Uh, Trey Rucker, got to give that guy credit. He tackled better in space than I thought he would. Made several big plays. Uh, and, and by big plays, I mean, if he doesn't make the play, it's yep. out the damn gate. Uh, Nicholas Martin is fantastic. The speed and violence. And also, I he got a high football IQ. He just does some things and it's almost it's 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 the combination of high football IQ and instincts mm -hmm. where 
he sees it's six man protection. He sees whether they were keeping Stogner in or the running back in that guy took their eyes off him. And he said, you know what? Meow. Just punishes Dylan Gabriel straight in the chest. Guy's just back though, didn't he? Yeah. Got guy is just, but he's just, he's a heck of a player, man. Yeah, he is. He's a heck of a player. And then while I, it should have been a bigger day for OU's wide receivers, in my opinion, I thought Oklahoma State on the outside, those corners really competed. They gave up some stuff, don't get me wrong, and they should have given up more, but they they battled. You know, I, I often I go through this this recap and I <laughs> – I tend to not mention the other team at all, but Oklahoma State, credit to those guys, holding them to 24. Uh, that is, while I think that it was more an Oklahoma issue, you, you got to give them the credit that they deserve. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I agree. And it's. I, I wish that as a football team we made we we made our opponent earn it a lot more. It's one thing to get in Oklahoma State offensively on some plays like they made some incredible catches, like some one handed you know batting R- it down. Rashad inside. Owens was an absolute beast in that game. He had a day. All right, he had he had an absolute day, and and Bowman had a great day, but. You know, we gave Ollie Gordon some stuff. Just get like made it way too easy. And it's the same thing when our offense is out there. Uh, we didn't make it difficult enough on their defense. We didn't. We didn't make the plays down the field. Nick Anderson. You know, we didn't. You know, we turned it over. Like not earn it turnovers. They they had the one where they earned it right, but then we give them two turnovers by poor snaps. Like we, we're just we're giving. Uh, hold on, hold Touch on. Away. One bad snap. The or, first yeah. one was not a bad exchange. Snap. Right. A fumbled exchange. Sorry, Dave, if, if you would have said about any other position, <laughs> I wouldn't have said a word, but hey, right. relax, okay? Right. He feels bad enough, okay? No, no, that, and that's right. That's right. But those those are not earned turnovers, in my opinion. We're, we're giving it away by uh, not managing the ball properly. So, like, that's... That's we have to get better at that. You know what? Now Oklahoma State's having this. That Oklahoma State's players, the fans having this on us for how no for who knows how long. That that bothers me. But Ollie Gordon, who is a heck of a player, and when he went down, that was I, I was glad he was all right. Yeah, agreed. right. I did. I didn't want that game to be to have the the asterisk of, oh, Ollie Gordon got hurt. So I was I was really glad he was okay. But my man struck the Heisman pose a little easy, a little early in the game, right? <laughs> there was like eight minutes to go in the game. And it was 24-21 when he scored. That was, I mean, that was bold. I know he's just having fun, but my goodness. And I hate that I can't laugh about that, that he did that because it should have been, he does the Heisman post. There's eight minutes left in the game. What are you doing? You lost the game. Right. But it was OU's offense. um, Not able to, not able to score enough points. It would have been so funny. And I don't even have that. (laughs) Now, in all likelihood, that that touchdown run is going to be the first thing you see on the Heisman. When he's a Heisman finalist, that's going to be the first thing you see on the highlight reel. And Oklahoma State's played themselves into a really good opportunity to go play in the Big 12 championship. They also might lose to UCF. They also might lose to UCF. Just saying. Never know. Anything else about OU's offense before we get to call your shot? I don't think so. Okay. Call your shot. We asked you guys your number one takeaway from the loss. 
Uh, this is an interesting one. It comes from at Carta Mac, who says back to back weeks of not trying to score before half with plenty of time on the clock and then losing by one possession. That's I, I, I don't know if that's the way to look at what happened at the end of the half against Oklahoma State. There, there was no that was a that was a game management mistake not using the time out there, not forcing them to punt, and allowing them to throw it into the end zone on the last play of the half. That was a game management mistake, but I don't think there was – because they threw what? It was incompletion, incompletion, run, and then the Hail Mary, right? That's how it unfolded at the end of the half? Yeah, so you think they should have called a timeout after the third and 10 Ollie Gordon run for four yards to the Oklahoma State 46? Correct to force them to punt the football and not allow them to throw it into the end zone on the last play of the half. Right. Because you don't, there, there's no reason to expose yourself to that play. Well, yeah. And yes, if you I think the assumption out, was, Hey, they're going to punt it here. And that's smart I, coaching from Gundy. Well, like, they probably why would I punt it? I'll just throw it the, in the end zone. Yeah. They probably thought they were just going to run the clock out. Um, and let like they didn't get it on third. We're not going to do anything on fourth. We'll run the clock out. But you know they threw it down there. Defended good. Desam McCola came up, blocked it. They weren't even. I mean, what on the ten or twelve yard line? I think is where that was ball came down. So, but I don't know. I, I mean, we got a we got a punt. We forced a punt, a three and out. After we missed the Zach Schmidt field goal with what two twenty four left, we forced a three and out, and we got the ball with a minute and thirty left. I think, no, we got the ball with a minute fifty left, and we go three and out. So I think at that point you're not, you're out of the we're trying to score phase. You're trying to not give up a score. I think. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, that, I guess there's different ways to attack that one, but in my opinion, that's that exchange right there is not what cost us the game. I, in my opinion, was it handled I perfectly? I don't know. I, we can go back and, and nitpick that. Like I'm sitting here thinking about it still, and it's been a couple of minutes and I don't, I don't know exactly like on the fly. I don't, I don't, I'm not with that one last Uh, week. Absolutely. I was confused as hell last week. Completely agree with last week. Yeah. Got to be more aggressive than that. Uh, This other one comes from T spiz. Oh nine. It's starting Ted. It's time. We start Jackson Arnold and get ready for the sec because realistically, OU is still a year or two away from really making some noise. I I anticipated this being the case once they lost this game. Uh, this is something that's going to get brought up. But I, what do you think? Could could OU know. sprinkle him in like Kansas State has sprinkled in Avery Johnson? Now I know that that's that's a different situation. Avery Johnson's a running quarterback. He can still he can throw it, but he like that balance has worked pretty well for K State. We'll get to that game. Oh my gosh, <laughs> what a fourth quarter! But it could you see OU doing something like that, getting Arnold some time? They haven't done it up to this point. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't see any harm in it. Honestly, I don't, I, I don't, I just, I don't know. I don't know if they do or not. I don't have, like, I don't know. I, I, I've i seen him in practice and seen him throw some balls and saw him in the spring game. And I've seen that stuff, but I don't know, like, I, I, I don't know, like, his level of execution that that's that's up to the coaches i mean i don't there's nothing wrong with it 
if you feel he's at that level and it's not going to cost you anything and you're not really exposing yourself by putting him out there, then, then fine. I, I just, I have a hard time with that because there's so many other things going on out there that can be fixed to where we're not even talking about this. And I understand that we're, we're at that moment and now we are talking about it. I don't know. That's why they get paid the big bucks. We'll let them decide that. Yeah. But I, I'm not calling for it, but I'd like to see him. I'm with you. He's a fun player to watch. It's the last thing I want to say about this game. It's extremely disappointing. Uh, anyone associated with OU, we're, we're all feeling the same way right now. 2013, and this is a this is a very back in my day uh, situation. But 2013, we went to Baylor on a Thursday night and got destroyed. Dismantled. It was like 41 to 10, 41 to 12, something like that. It was embarrassing is what it was. And I think that maybe was the only time I gave a speech after a game, like win or lose. And at that point in time, and this was before the portal and like some of these, some of these things, some of these factors that are at play now in college football, but the gist of the speech was we've got two choices. We can come together and we can finish strong and see what happens. We were, hey, we knew we weren't going to play for a national title. We knew we weren't going to big win a big 12 championship. We knew that, but it was, how are you going to represent yourself? How are you going to represent your family? How were, how are you going to represent your school the rest of the way? You can, you can fracture and fold or you can come as close as you've been and finish as strong as you can. And the only reason I bring it up, we lost that game. We went, it took us to seven and two. It's the exact same situation. We won the last three regular season games and we went and played in a bowl game that is truly one of the best memories of my entire life. Yep. That was amazing. The and it wasn't it wasn't a title was game. Great. And I, I don't care. It's one of the best memories I have in my entire fucking life. I know that the the goals that you had are probably gone. But you can still find meaning and fulfillment in the rest of the journey. It may not feel like that way right now, but I don't know if any of these guys, any of these players listen to this, but you can still, you can still accomplish something, even though it wasn't what you set out to accomplish at the start. And I, I just hope, I hope these guys stick together. Yeah. Well, hey, you pull it together and you win the next one, you see what happens. And then you win the one after that and you see what happens. And you win the one after that and you see what happens. I I think mathematically they could still perhaps make it to the Big 12 championship game. I don't know what all would have to happen. Someone's got to beat Texas. Someone's got to beat Texas. Like, there's, there's all. Someone's got to. Like, I don't. I don't know. There's a bunch of things that have to happen. It's a very, very outside chance. But you never know what. Ha- just win the next one, get better, and you may have an opportunity to still win the Big Twelve championship, or you may have an opportunity to go play in a great bowl game. Yeah, I, there's. You're right. You don't bail on it now. That's for sure. Exactly. You've put in way too much work through the offseason to bail on it now because you can still get something good out of it for sure. 
let's recap some of the best games of week 10 in college football. But first, John Vance Auto Group has a deal for Oklahoma Breakdown listeners. Go to any of their nine full service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. Tell them we sent you and they'll give you $500 off. That's $500 off just because you listen to this podcast. They've been serving Oklahomans for 40 years, family owned and operated. And no matter what your vehicle needs are, John Vance Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way. You can find all the information about their lifetime loyalty program, browse their entire inventory, and find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. Attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in orders on a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, Connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. With all the garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. Kansas State, Texas. The Longhorns win 33 to 30 in overtime. And the fourth quarter of this game was insane, Ted. Insane. It was wild. I was, I had one eye on it in the booth up there while our game was going on. Um, I guess the fourth quarter was, was as we were gearing up for kickoff. And then the overtime was as we were just getting underway. And it was wild. Kansas State came roaring back and, Choked down the stretch. I missed an extra point, missed a chip shot field goal inside the 10. It was crazy. When so Kansas State turns the ball over a couple times coming out of the half. Jonathan Brooks makes him pay, scores a touchdown. They add another field goal. It was 27 to 7. It was over. And then stuff got weird. Uh, Phillip Brooks scores the touchdown at the end of the third quarter. Malik Murphy mindlessly throws an interception on a screen pass where the running back doesn't even get out on the screen. K-State scores. Uh, very next Jonathan play. Brooks fumbles. Wasn't on the very next play? Yeah, K-State scores again. And all on of a the sudden, first play. There was one point where it flashed up a graphic in there and it said Kansas State has scored three touchdowns on their last four offensive snaps. <laughs> uh, it was it was an all-time met- meltdown for Texas. Yep. But <sighs> K-State's kicker just now he choked but then he redeemed himself. Mm-hmm. Right? He yanks the I think it was a 27-yarder and then buries the 45 yarder to send it to overtime because of course kickers right but when texas kicked that field goal in the first overtime and k state had it there what was it for, first and goal to six i i thought i thought there was no way that k state didn't win that football game no no i i did not i did not like the play call um, and they were a little, you know, they had ha- been having their success kind of when they have Texas on their heels a little bit. And there was a review on that exchange and it, it all had just kind of slowed to, to a halt. And Will Howard just, you know, they tried that little, it's similar to our fourth down play. I know it wasn't a sprint out, but it was just a little out route to the tight end and he was covered and there's nowhere else to go with the football after that. It's like, what do we do now? The, the second down play, they had second and goal. They run the jump pass or like he's faking like he is going QB power. Mm-hmm. There are three guys 
all open in the end zone and the ball gets tipped. I, it was just, I mean, brutal. But what what did you think about Chris Kleiman going forward on fourth down there? Fourth and goal, games on the You tie it, you send it to another overtime with the field goal. What did you think about that? As they were walking, I didn't feel good about it. Like I said, because the momentum of, of that drive, it was too it was too like broken up and Texas had too much time to kind of sit back and, and figure out what they wanted to do. I didn't like it at, at the time. But I and I I love Chris Kleiman. I thought it was a mistake. But you have to remember, they also botched an extra point that would have gave him the lead. And the field goal kicker missed a kick from that about that same area. Right. So he's got that in his head too. But I'm I'm with you. I I just think in that moment, typically when you have the less talented team, you go for the win. But and if you're on the road. On the road. And but Kansas State is just they have been such a much better red zone team than Texas. And Murphy, Malik Murphy, was not crisp in this game. Oh, they were falling apart. Which... That's what I, I think you extended there. Yeah. You make you make Malik Murphy make some throws with the field condensed, right? That's what the overtime format is. Yeah. So I I actually like Kansas State's odds more if they would have extended the game there. But got one play to win the football game. I I get it but just couldn't get the job done. And I think my main takeaway from this game is that Texas needs Quinn Ewers back quickly. Yeah. Murphy, yeah. he a hot start, right? Pushing the deep ball. I'm on the headset telling you oh, you're an good. idiot. <laughs> but just some critical mistakes, some horrible throws. And Kansas State even dropped it. What, he had two interceptions. should have been three. They dropped one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, weird game. Weird they game. need yours bad. I thought we might see Arch a little bit. Uh, what is? What do you take from that? The fact that we haven't at all, and it really, I mean, I know he's maybe said a couple of things about maybe they will, but if you haven't at this point. what Once Malik Murphy threw the interception on the screen when there was no running back there, I thought we were officially on arch watch. He's but, either he's either terrible or he's already told them that he's transferring and doesn't want to play. Or the Manning family told Steve Sarkeesian, you are not playing him this year. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I don't know. That doesn't not seem ready. like something they would do, but if he's not ready and they kind of know it and they don't want to put him out there to where he's like in a tough spot where your quarterback's been hurt. I, I mean, I don't know. It seems like it's already been decided though, that he's not playing, I guess is the point. And I don't know why. Uh, I, you got to imagine Malik Murphy's just been way more consistent than him or, or else you go to him in that game with the way that Malik Murphy was playing. So I, I don't know. Texas defense deserves credit though. Uh, I know that a, a lot of the errors were not exactly their fault. They got put in some bad spots, but K state who prides themselves in running the football in a variety of ways, they could not run the ball at all, mm -mm. especially early fell in a big hole. They had to get away from the run game. Kansas State's running backs, warden Giddens, they they've been good. 52 yards rushing combined. Yep. Pretty dang good were, for Texas. They were – the first half for Kansas State was – it was ugly offensively. Ugly. Yeah. Anything else on that game? Nope. Longhorns need viewers back. Missouri went to Georgia and gave the dogs a game. Final score 30-21. Just a really good and competitive football game. I was impressed with Missouri. And yeah. then Georgia did, did what championship teams do. They finished in the fourth quarter. Uh, Brady Cook had been 
pretty dang good for Missouri throughout this game, but the late interception to the big fella, Nazir Stackhouse rumbling, bumbling, stumbling. It was just, it was a bad decision with the football from Cook and really, really cost that team. Damn shame there was an illegal block on that return because it was such, he was moving. That dude, that dude was moving. But Missouri gets one last crack at it. Throw another INT, you know, just trying to make a play. It is what it is. But Ted, when Georgia's defense needed to get stops, they stepped up and got stops. Yeah. You know, and, and Missouri found some stuff on them. And it was, it was, it was surprising and cool to see them move the ball and have some success and, and be in the fight. But I, every now and then, whenever Georgia makes a play, defensively it's like oh my god no one else looks like that you know it's they look just, insane from yeah. just from a height weight like a measurables a physical build whoa and it's like what strikes me is this the speed and, and the way they close on the second third level if you if you throw something in the flat and maybe make the first guy miss it. There are incoming missiles. Like they are flying to the football with some athletic guys that will absolutely strike you. They're impressive. But even they have trouble with the mobile quarterback. Yeah. Uh, Brady, Brady cook did some nice stuff. Well, whenever you, a good defense that has good athletes, when they're coming downhill at you is whenever they're great. The angles are good. You can use your speed, but as soon as a quarterback breaks and now you're left running laterally, that's whenever things break down. And yeah, they they could be exposed that way for sure. Yeah, and he cooked did some nice stuff with his legs, called QB run games, scrambles, extended plays with his legs until those interceptions late. I thought I thought he played really well. Luther Burden had the long touchdown on the first drive, and then now he did roll an ankle. But then basically they they put the handcuffs on him. He was what ends up with three catches in this one. Dio Weiss was good. Five for ninety. Yep. But and oh you could use that guy, by the way. But I thought Georgia coming in the game, I thought they would try to eliminate Burden and they paid him a ton of attention and he he didn't do a whole lot. After that first drive, the last thing I have on this game. Are we sure Carson Beck's not the best quarterback in all of college football? No. He's he is he's really good. He's efficient. He puts He's also ball. huge. Is he? I don't know. I've he I I was watching him and I was watching the way he moves. I was like, dang. That's a that's fluid. Like he looks good. He looks athletic. Let me check how big he is. 6'4, 235. Huh. Yeah, I didn't realize that. I had no clue. I texted Aaron Murray. I was like, tell me about this Beck guy. Is he <laughs> and he was like, he's thick, man. But 21 of 32, 254, two touchdowns. He has some great anticipatory throws in this game. Got a lot of juice in that right arm. A uh, good mobility. Now, Missouri did a nice job of getting to him. They sacked him four or five times. He was under pressure, but even when he was feeling that pressure, he was stepping in the throws, taking it in the chest. Uh, I like him more than Drake May. I think I think this is the only time we're going to see Carson Beck play college football. I think he's going to be gone. I think he's going to be the second quarterback off the board. Maybe at the very sure? least. Yes. Hmm. I think Caleb Williams will probably still be first. And I I think just, just from watching Beck, I think he's the best pure passer if he comes out. I think he processes well. I think he's got a big arm. He's got the size. I I think this is the last time. They're, they're, enjoy him now because I think he's I think he's gonna enter the draft. Yeah. Unless I, I guess some Georgia booster could come out and say, no, 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 you're coming back for another year. Here's a lot of millions, but I, I think he's that good. 
I, I think he is being slept on as a as a prospect. Well, there's he he's in that that position where it really doesn't matter what he does unless he loses him the game. The credit's going to go to that team being a defensive team, right? I mean, that's I think that's that's what's going on here. And here's the other thing: is they haven't necessarily there haven't been any big noteworthy games yet. People will be talking about Carson Beck, but they got Tennessee coming up. Yeah, I mean they're in the East, so yeah, they have yeah. to have them. I think they got Tennessee coming up. Obviously, SEC championship game and whatever happens moving forward there, but they really haven't had a showcase position very often this year. They've got, ooh, Ole Miss, then Tennessee, finish with Georgia Tech, and then they'll have, I assume, Bama in an SEC championship game. So the marquee games are coming, and with that, a possible Heisman campaign for Carson Beck also coming. If he plays really, really well in him. Yeah. Yep. Last thing if on this there's game. There's no one else, uh, Heisman, right now. It's just kind of, uh, I mean, Penix had a big win, but it doesn't feel like anyone's just grabbed the thing. Maybe Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah. Last thing on that game. Eli Drinkwitz. He's doing a nice job. I, dude was absolutely on the hot seat coming into the season and he says some annoying things. There's just no doubt, but they're the number 12 team in the country going into this game. They played Georgia really well. Again, that team looks good physically. I think they may move up in the standings after this loss. Might. Yeah. They've done, they're way better than I thought they were going to be. Um, I it, Missouri seems like it's weird. I I feel like it's maybe the most overlooked program. I, there's just something about uh, there's just something about them that you know you just don't I don't know I don't think about them a whole lot. They're not one of the names that comes up whenever you're talking about the SEC or because they still don't necessarily always feel like an SEC team and then. I don't know. It's just, it's kind of a weird dynamic. Uh, this cannot be debated. No one has given Georgia more problems than them over the last two seasons. Yeah. Which it, I'm not sure what it means, but it, it doesn't mean nothing. There's something to be said for it for sure. Yeah. Last game, LSU went to Tuscaloosa and got beat. Uh, the Crimson Tide win 42 to 28 was an awesome back and forth first half. Jalen Milrow and Jaden Daniels just making all kinds of plays. I have to imagine every defensive coordinator that was watching that game, watching those guys run around and make plays with their legs was just, I assume they had nightmares about it when they, once they went to bed, it, they, these guys were just phenomenal with their legs and Alabama, they outplayed LSU in the second half. Yep. Uh, more specifically that Alabama defense, uh, they, they really stepped up after LSU scored on that first drive out of the half LSU's last four drives of the game, punt tip ball, interception, punt turnover on downs. Clearly Jaden Daniels leaving with the concussion was a huge blow. Uh, for LSU and kind of felt like we got robbed of what could have been an awesome ending. If he wouldn't yeah. have gotten hurt, uh, who knows what happens if the star quarterback for the, for the Tigers doesn't go out there, but Bama just continues to win football games. Yes, they do. Yep. And they are, they've, they've just gotten, they've gotten incrementally better week by week, whenever everyone saw them at their worst early in the year in one of the biggest games of uh, this season against Texas, they got beat at home, and then the, they followed that up with a poor performance in a win against South Florida, and everyone left them for dead. And from that point on, they've just gotten a little bit better, a little bit better, 
every single day and they're they're turning into a really really good football team and you're right Milrow is running around and you watch you watch Georgia struggle a little bit with a mobile quarterback I mean I I still favor Georgia if if that's the matchup in the SEC championship game but it's getting more and more interesting by the week. And Jalen Milrow, so he's starting to look more comfortable throwing the ball. Mm-hmm. Better timing, uh, quicker decisions. He's just an absolute nightmare as a runner. He's a jumbo running back. He's a big, strong, fast dude. 155 yards, four touchdowns rushing. And what if, do you see them do the tush push? And he just... Find the... Uh, it just went left. Yeah. Just kind of backed into the end zone. It was pretty funny. But he is he's getting better. And I think Tommy Reese is getting better at calling plays for him. And, and that offensive line, that offensive line's been criticized this year. And and they still they still have their struggles in pass protection. But that running game got going in the second half. Woodell Williams, Jace McClellan ripping off big chunks. Uh, Milro continued to be an absolute menace running the football. I, I don't think people realize how big he is. He's like, if we had Kenneth Murray playing quarterback, all right, with that size and speed, <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. They, they're looking pretty good. And Alabama, we we all know how talented they are. They're getting better. And it certainly feels like that that matchup between them and Georgia is looking more and more likely in the SEC championship game. And that one is going to be awesome. Yep. A lot of football to be played. Don't want to assume a lot, anything. A lot. But yeah, that uh that one could be pretty, pretty fun to watch. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first. Do you have difficulty sitting for long periods of time or can't lay on your side due to pain? Well, it's a hip thing. And the only person to go see is Dr. Brandon Johnson at the Hip Clinic in Oklahoma City. No matter your age, the Hip Clinic has the experience and knowledge to help ease your hip pain and preserve your hip joint. Don't let the pain hold you back any longer. Don't just accept a hip replacement. Call the Hip Clinic today at 844-KEEP-HIP or visit thehipclinicokc.com. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSSAA athletics, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? I had to go with the Big 12. Uh, whenever you look at the games that went down in the Big 12, which we had a bunch of awesome matchups, the top six all played one another. Um, obviously, we know um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Kansas State, Texas, but then you had Kansas, Iowa State, uh, also played one another. So that that's your top six. But every game uh, was a one-score game, except for BYU getting blown out by West Virginia. But Which, awesome. West Virginia playing their best football of the season. And perfect timing. Coming to Norman on Saturday. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect timing. You had the one-score game with TCU and Tech on Thursday night. It was a pretty good football game. We had the overtime game with Kansas State, Texas that we talked about. Um, you also had um, the overtime game with Houston and Baylor. That game was 25-24. That was crazy. One score game with Kansas and Iowa State, 28-21. And our game was uh, a three-point game tight down the stretch. And then UCF Cincinnati, 28-26 in that game. A bunch of awesome football being played in the big 12 and you know it's interesting i heard urban meyer when i was watching the big noon kickoff um whatever they were talking about he said 
Pac-12 is the number one conference in college football. The Big 12 is number two. And I thought that was interesting. Um, you know, if you want to talk about competitiveness and everyone kind of having an opportunity, I think that's right. Whenever you look at the the top half of the conference and a lot of teams are still in the fight and we're playing a lot of close football games. It's been a fun season and I imagine we're going to have fireworks as this thing closes down. Uh, I think there, there could be a few wrinkles left these last couple of weeks. I, this was something that I was workshopping uh, on Sirius X and big 12 radio for a while in the off season, the conference of competition. <laughs> I, I, I told like Brett Yormark, you can have it for free commissioner, the conference of competition. And that's, that's how it feels, especially with, you know, Texas, it at a point in the season, what three weeks ago, it felt like Texas and Oklahoma, and a, then there was a gap. It does not feel that way anymore, uh, especially with Texas not having yours, and especially with what's happened with Oklahoma over the last couple of weeks. Have we melted down? Yes. I, what I, I mean. I don't know if that's the best way to put it, but the springboard that the Texas game was supposed to be, right? And remember, there's a bye week after that. You had time to rest. They played their worst, worst football of the season after their biggest win of the year. Traditionally, uh, Ted, you would call that some front running. Yeah. Which is shocking. I know. Hmm. It's not over yet, though. You got time to to get right, and who knows what could happen with this season. Need some help. Need some help. But, yeah, you're right. It was it was a really fun weekend in the Big 12. How about the Kansas Jayhawks? Impressive win. I didn't I didn't see that one coming. I thought Iowa State was going to win that football game. Jason Bean, turnover free. Didn't turn it over, won the football game. Impressive. Kansas. Kansas. Is four and two in the Big 12 and seven and two overall. Lance Leipold can coach. They're going to have to pay that man. They're going to have to back up the Brinks truck again. Yep. To to keep him. They they extended him. Travis Goff is calling boosters right now. Hey, we got to we got to find more. He's going to have trouble keeping his coaches too. You know, I said they, it on I it I said it on Twitter. Iowa should throw a massive bag of cash at Andy Kotelnicki, their offense coordinator. Yeah. Someone's going to. Might as well be Iowa. They've got a they've got a spot o- available. Yeah, I know. All right, who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Uh loser, I had to go with the University of Southern California. Mm. Um, tough one. They had they had an opportunity. They were in the fight, but they could not get the offense going late when they needed it and they could not get stops late whenever they needed it um and i know that's been the recurring theme they gave up uh 52 to washington and they were blanked in the fourth quarter they gave up 10 in the fourth quarter they couldn't get the ball down the field uh it was just too much uh for Caleb williams to be able to overcome and you could see the scene after the game. I'm guessing that was his mom that he went up to in the stands. That was um that was a painful one for for USC. I think the most discouraging thing if you're a USC fan was okay, if it's Michael Penix and the receivers picking you apart, that's one thing. I think we all acknowledge how talented Washington is at the quarterback position and the wide receiver position. Washington rushed for 316 yards and five touchdowns. Dylan Johnson had 256 in four touchdowns. 
Washington, they don't run the ball. That's not something they really do. And they came into that game and they said, you know what? We don't think your defense can stop us running the ball. I mean, Penix's line, 22 of 30, two touchdowns and interception for him. It's okay. Mm -hmm. They shoved it down their face, dude. Yep. And they don't do that. That's not what they do. They ran it straight at USC, and they couldn't do a damn thing about it. Yikes. Yeah, it's brutal. It's tough. And, you know, the other thing that stood out in that game to me, and I know there's there's a lot of, uh, a lot of negative feedback coming around the, the defense of the program, but they have the reigning Heisman Trophy winning, uh, winner. They're a two-loss team. They're ranked in the top 25. You got the number five team in the country coming to town. Huge opportunity. And which, you know, they've already, you know, cut off half of that stadium. Like, they don't even have the whole stadium available. But they don't they don't hardly get numbers there for a game like that. That's crazy, man. With all of the, the buzz around that program at this time, and you got a, a a top five team coming to town. I was shocked by that. How were you shocked by that? Well, well it, I, maybe it's, shocked isn't the right. Well, I think I think it's surprising that Lincoln Riley and that staff have not been able to create more momentum with the fan base. Right. And you mentioned it there. There's clearly a large portion of that fan base is very frustrated what's going on on, with the defense. There's no doubt about it. And people usually vote with their feet, right? If you disprove, disapprove with what's going on defensively, you don't show up, but also it ain't that complicated. People do not, that fan base does not care about football the way that the people that you and I know care about football. They just don't. If, Once they if, lost two games, ah, we'll do something else on Saturday. That's how those people are. I hate to give like a blanket statement for that entire fan base, but that's just my read on it. I know. It's like, you know, and we've talked about this before, but the the whole, you know, there's nothing to do in – Oklahoma or whatever. It's not the flex you think it is. There is a lot of other stuff to do in LA like uh, Rams or Chargers or Clippers or Lakers or Dodgers. Like, not only are you not the only show in town, like you ain't close to the only show in town. And if you don't have the absolute spotlight, then forget about it. And even if you do have the absolute spotlight, I'm not sure what type of traffic they get. It's crazy. That stadium looks gigantic, dude. (laughs) It's nuts. I looked it up. It held like 108,000 people in like 1935. That's crazy. It's it's wild because I was looking at it. I was like, man. It ain't full, but I wonder how many it holds if it is full because it's just – it's a bowl that just, like, goes through the sky. It's wild. There is also quite a bit of purple and gold yeah. in that stadium for that it's game. True. Crazy. Not, not, the, not the home field advantage. Not the, the home environment you're looking for if you're Lincoln Riley uh, and those players. You gotta win games. Yeah. You gotta you gotta be you gotta be cool. You gotta be people gotta be talking about you. People have to be want to be seen at the game for those people to show up. Just how it is out there. Crazy. They're not gonna show up for a seven and three football team. It's how those it's how it is. I, right. It tells me they're not gonna show up, period. 
Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. Let's get to my winner and loser. But first. Elevate your tailgate with Chapel Supply and Equipment. Oklahoma City Chapel Supply and Equipment has generators and inverters on hand that will give you all the power you need so you can take your tailgate to the next level. They've also got the top-of-the-line heaters to keep you warm during those cold tailgates later in the season. Oklahoma owned and operated. Elevate your tailgate by calling 405-495-1722 or visit chapelsupply.com. That's C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L supply.com. And First Fidelity Bank knows how to keep fans like you happy with more than 50 awards in the last five years, including Forbes Best in State Bank, the Oklahoma's Community Choice Awards, and the Journal Records Reader Rankings. It's clear that they are Oklahoma's number one pick for quality banking. And you can find that level of outstanding service and everything FFB offers. Open an, an award-winning oh, open an account at an award-winning bank today at FFB.com. First Fidelity Bank, we go where you go. Head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. For my winner of the weekend, the Clemson Tigers and Dabo Sweeney. How about that? Big win. Beat Notre Dame 31-23 there in Death Valley. Now, it brings them to 5-4 and four on the season. Not great. But with everything that was going on, with all the conversation that has been surrounding Dabo and the way he does things, it's a nice win. And it had to feel really good. And, and Ted, I saw a lot of people saying, take that, Tyler from Spartanburg. Take that, buddy. You know it's the complete opposite with that guy. There's no doubt. He feels, I can tell you with 100% certainty, that Tyler from, Sp from Spartanburg was watching that and going, I did this. That wins. I, I made that happen. I inspired the football team. I You're guarantee welcome. you that's what yeah. he's thinking. You're welcome, Tigers fans. You think he calls in this week to the coaches show? I, he, I, he has to. <laughs> we need uh, Tyler. You have to call in. And Dabo, I guarantee you Dabo wants him to call in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was great. I mean, after winning that one, this is, this is, it's one of those things that makes college football so great. The fact that Dabo Sweeney is taking calls from, from Tyler. But yeah, we need the follow-up. We have to have it. It's, it, there's just no excuse to not have it. We, we need that content immediately. That's great. That's good. Nice win for him, though. I, I don't know how much it it changes what the season may become for him, but um, that's a big one that they needed at, at the moment, for sure. I I completely agree. Now, Cade Klubnik still does not wow me. I agree. But I, I just, he, he just doesn't do it for me. But the Clemson running game, it was much better than some of the performances they've had this season. Phil Moffa, he he had a late fumble that could have really cost him. But other than that, just a really nice day running the rock. Had a huge impact on the game for Clemson, especially with Will Shipley out for that one. But all the credit goes to Clemson's defense and special teams. Had a They had a pick six. Trotter had the pick six in the first half, which – and then – First half, they also they forced Notre Dame to kick a few field goals. It made them settle for field goals. And then when it felt like the momentum was on Notre Dame's side there in the fourth quarter, uh, Clemson's, Clemson's defense shut the door. Man, last six drives of the game for the Irish. Punt, 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 interception. Turnover on down. And that came after Maffa had the fumble, right? They fumble. Clemson's defense runs out on the field, said, no problem. We got it. Shuts the door. It was, it was really impressive. And the punt team played a huge role. They pinned Notre Dame in the fourth quarter deep over and over and over again. And Klubnik, he even, he had a quick kick. There's just like Dylan Gabriel had field position. How about that? Yeah. Turns out it still matters. Quick kicks, not. I mean, it's a good play. As much as people go for it on fourth down now, 
I think it's I think it's a really nice option to have to where you don't have a chance to get a returner back, easy to get down there with wide outs to to try and down the ball. Probably gonna see a lot more of it moving forward. Two other things on this game. Sam Hartman was not good. 13 of 30 for 146, two picks, including the pick six, just not. Now we did do, he did some nice stuff with his legs, but that guy went from, hey, could he go win a Heisman Trophy to I'm not sure he's going to get drafted. Like, it has been – it's I been just, it's been a rough month for Sam Hartman. I feel like it's been written in stone that Notre Dame is just not allowed to have an elite <laughs> offense. They haven't had – they've been they've been good at times offensively, but – as long as I've been like following college football or involved in it nearly 25 years, I don't think they've ever been better than just good on offense. They've never had a gray or elite offense that I can remember. You know who would be good? Andy Kotelnicki. There you go. A lot of, yeah, lot of tight ends, a lot of good. shifts, yeah. a lot of motion. Maybe mm-hmm. get a little more mobile of a quarterback there in South Bend. Kansas fans are going to get be pissed at us. We're trying to give their offense coordinator away to anyone. <laughs> I mean, yeah. The yeah. I I wonder if there's I I guarantee you there's a lot of Notre Dame fans discussing this already, but I wonder if there's going to be a conversation about Marcus Fre- Freeman being the right guy for Notre Dame this off season. It's a bad loss. That's that Clemson team is not good. Yeah. So uh, that that chatter is the the volume's going to get a little louder on that conversation. And then the only other thing is, under no circumstances should Notre Dame wear any other away jersey than what they wore in this game. All white with the gold helmet. It, it was so good looking. It should almost be illegal. <laughs> I mean, my, it was gorgeous. They should never wear anything else on the road, but that it, oh, I can't believe they lost in that look. It's a shame. It's a damn shame. Is it that it looks that good or is it whatever you put it against how horrible Clemson's uniforms look? It, there's definitely some of that, but you know me, I'm the all white look, the all white road look always looks OU's good. is amazing. I'll, I hate saying it, but Texas's all white look is awesome. Mm-hmm. Notre Dame, you've got the all white, and then the most iconic helmet in the sport looks good. It looks they, is that what they usually do? They usually do gold pants and white, right? Yeah, I thought the all white was yeah. phenomenal. My loser of the weekend, the Texas A and M Aggies, uh, went on the road to Ole Miss and end up losing the game 38-35, which drops them to 5-4 and four on the season. And I'm convinced if A&M didn't block the field goal and return it for a touchdown in the first half of this game, I think Ole Miss blows them out. I think they blow them. I think they, I think they play them off the field. But that completely changed the momentum of the football game, and I just want to be entertained. It, it gave us a dramatic finish. You never want to leave it up to the kicker. Never. Never want to leave it up to the kicker, and A&M misses a 47-yarder to send it to overtime. And all of a sudden, you look up, and Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin's got them. They're 8-1. and one. All right. All right, Lane. Okay. I watched the first half of that game. Nice setup in the Oklahoma State radio booth. We had two TV set up. I had K-State. Uh, Texas on, and we had Ole Miss A and M on. I'm just telling you, the first half of that football game is some of the worst football I've seen at like for any conference. It was bad, just bad. It looked it was terrible. Guys dropping passes, the protection for quarterbacks just pathetic, and they're like running around. It was terrible, dude. It was terrible football to watch. They looked, both of those teams 
looked awful. Now, sounds like they got it together some in the second half and they started playing better football, but when I was watching the first half, I was thinking, like, these two teams are terrible. Terrible. Ole Miss included. I Texas A&M's offense, it got off to, I think it was punt, 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 their first four possessions. I think they only had five possessions in the first half. Mm. And now in the second half, they got the run game going. Max Johnson did some nice things. He also threw a pick in the end zone. Not good. But they had the lead. They scored, and they have the lead with under five minutes to go in the game. And a and that defense, they, they could not get the stop when they needed it. And, and I'm not sure what's happened to that group. And, and I know that Kiffin and Charlie Weiss Jr., like that's a creative creative duo that's coming up with plays for Ole Miss, no doubt. But they just had guys running wide open, uncovered. Over and over and over again. And I I just don't know how that happens when you have the level of athletes that A&M's got. It's bad. They're just running free, Ted. Wide open. Not even making it difficult on Jackson Dart. And they've played really good defense at times, too. It's wild. I don't know. But Quinshawn Judkins, guy is, he good. He did his thing on the ground for Ole Miss, and then the difference in the game was Trey Harris. That guy was catching everything for Ole Miss. 11 for 213 and a touchdown. And the majority of his catches felt like he just went over to the top of guys and grabbed it. (laughs) I mean, he had an insane one-handed catch on the sideline also. Yeah, that was crazy. I saw that. That was impressive. But Dart was pretty damn aggressive pushing it down the field to him. And it was clear with what he said leading into the game and the way that he was acting on the sideline, Lane Kiffin wanted this one real bad. That That, man was celebrating every time they were scored. It was awesome. The camera would cut to him. There was like a, a Lane celebration cam. If players did what Lane was doing, they would get a 15 yard penalty. It was, I, it was just hilariously entertaining to watch. I loved it. I please absolutely back, loved it. Please back it up. Please back it up. We've got to back up what I said. <laughs> what was it? Uh, if you'd seen the recruiting classes they'd had in the last three years, you'd think they'd be the one that's ranked in the top 10, something like that. It's pretty good. Did He said something about bowl eligibility being their yeah. goal. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty good. But, hey, Ole Miss, 8-1, and one, and – We'll we'll see. We'll see what they're really made of now because that is that's gonna be an interesting one in Athens on Saturday. Yeah. We'll see where they're at from a from a physicality standpoint. Birthday shout outs. Welcome to the world, Malachi Allgood. Happy first birthday to Eloise. Borland nailed it. Happy sixth birthday to Greer Cooper. Happy eighth birthday to Camden Westmoreland. Happy 16th birth. <laughs> Damn it. Happy 16th birthday to Ruth Izzel Gustin. Happy 31st birthday to Dylan Watts. Happy 36th birthday to Moses Madu. Let's go. What? How about that? Happy 38th birthday to Cody Cooper. Happy 50th birthday. That's a big one. The big 5-0 to James Frisbee. And happy birthday to Monica Pomosia. That looks, that sounds good to me. P-O-E-M-O-E-C-E-A-H. Pomosia. Just say it with confidence. Pomosia. Pomosia. <laughs> happy birthday to Mac and welcome to the world, Miles. And congratulations to Austin Minson on having your Wings pinned on. Nice. It's a big deal. I think it is. if my memory serves me correctly, like a helicopter, like an assault helicopter pilot. That's awesome. That's awesome. Congrats. It's all going to be okay, OU fans. <laughs> Let's all stick together. On that note, 
episode 368 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Wednesday. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from three to six on the ref. You can hear me from two to five on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, channel 375. Hope you all have a great start to your week. And until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.